Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Mark Moss Show where we're talking about the world changing as a world of decentralization and deglobalization is upon us and we got a lot to cover. I'll try to bring you some education and some of the latest breaking news headlines so you can see the signs, the play-by-play -play of how this world is breaking down. And so we're going to talk about what is going on in the economy? Everyone's screaming for recession while the markets are high. We're going to talk about some of these signs that we have there. We're going to talk about this new bill that just got passed in Bitcoin that has massive implications. This is just breaking news. We're going to talk about what the heck is going on with commodities, specifically with oil. What is going on with um, China? Man, we have a lot to cover. We're going to talk about what's going on with uh in, in the U.S. with some big, big, big domestic news. Anyway, got a lot to cover. You don't want to miss this. If you do miss any of it, don't worry. We got you covered. You can check it out on the podcast. Just search The Mark Moss Show on your favorite podcast player or go watch me on YouTube. Uh, just search Market Disruptors and you can watch me and listen to me over there. But just jumping right in, like I said, we had some big news in the Bitcoin space this week, um, which is the technology, the decentralized technology that's really starting to drive massive change around the world. And one of the big changes that just happened is something called um, FASB, Financial Accounting Standard Board. All right, it's a big deal. Bloomberg reported on this, um, Bloomberg Tax specifically, uh, about this, these financial accounting standards. And so basically, uh, as a company, as a corporation, you have to follow what's called GAAP, General um, Accepted Accounting Principles or whatever. And so you have to file this. You have to keep your books in a certain order. You have to file your reports in a certain order, especially if you're publicly traded companies. So there's all types of regulations, especially, especially in the banking sector, but all types of regulations that talk about how you can hold assets, how you can classify them, how you can value them, how you report them, and all these different types of things. And the way that you're able to handle and manage assets very greatly, and they change the incentives for you to want to have those types of assets. So for example, um, if I can hold a certain type of asset that gives me a lot of, lot of leverage, I might want to hold that for reasons besides just holding it. But also I might want to hold an asset, but that um, the incentives work against me and I don't want to. So let, let me break this down for you. So for Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, for example, um, the new rules under this new um, Financial Accounting Standards Board, the new rules would allow a better reflection of the actual market value of the digital assets, as well as bring greater transparency to the financial reporting of companies that hold them. Now, these changes aren't in effect yet. Uh, it's just getting published. They expect to be published by the end of this year and then go into effect as soon as 2025. Uh, but it looks like companies will be able to start applying them earlier than that. And so basically, um, the old treatment before this is that like Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies is an intangible asset, which means that if the price went lower than what the companies bought it for, then they'd have to take an impairment charge on their books, even if they didn't sell. And so um, we talked about this a couple weeks ago with uh, SpaceX had to mark down the Bitcoin that they had on their books. So in the old treatment, if the prices went down, they had to take this impairment charge. They had the negative, but they didn't get the positive. If the, if the price went up, they couldn't receive any benefit on their books unless they sold it. All right. So this means so if you're a business, if you're a corporation, if you're reporting these numbers, then you want to know what your balance sheet has. So that means what are the assets on the book? So typically, if I'm looking at a publicly traded company, I want to look at like, what is this company's liquidation value? If I bought this company and liquidated it, I, how much inventory do they have? How much uh, money in the bank do they have? How much, how much is the total value of all their assets? So let's say that the total value of all their assets is 100 million, but I can buy them, I can buy the stock for 50 million. That's a pretty good deal. The problem is, is that under these old accounting rules, you can't use Bitcoin or crypto assets fair market value. So you bought Bitcoin at a dollar and now it's worth 30,000. You went, you know, you had a uh, hundred thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin. Now you got a hundred million dollars worth of Bitcoin. You can't put the hundred million on there. And so because of that, a lot of these big corporations don't want to add it because they only get the negative, this impairment charge. They have to mark it down showing that they're in a loss, which is what happened to SpaceX. And, and, but they can't show the upside. So like I said, when Bitcoin price plunge, uh, surges goes up, 
the companies aren't able to reflect that. So this is a really, really big deal. This could make uh, companies, I think it will make companies way more likely to add Bitcoin to their balance sheet and to become long-term holders because now they can report the appreciation without having to sell anything. So they can take little bets today with these uh, Bitcoin or crypto assets expecting a big return. And then in the future, they could report earnings based off of the new balance, the new asset prices, which could make them look like geniuses, which could bolster their balance sheet, which could, uh, you know, ultimately if they're a publicly traded company, affect their stock price. Now, Michael Saylor, the CEO of, uh, well, now he stepped down, um, of uh, MicroStrategy, I think he's still the chairman of MicroStrategy. Um, he's one of the biggest Bitcoin holders in the world, one of the most uh, publicly outspoken Bitcoin advocates in the world. And he believes this is massive news. He's been um, trying to get this to go through for a long time, so it's a big deal. Uh, some other things I saw in the Bitcoin space this week, in the crypto space this week, was uh, really, really interesting. And I don't want to say crypto space, it was spe specifically in the Bitcoin space. And it's because of the Bitcoin mining. So most of the other cryptocurrencies have all moved over to something called proof of stake, where they don't use mining. And you've been seeing over the last couple of years how Bitcoin mining specifically is this uh, detriment to society, how it's going to ruin the environment, how Bitcoin is going to use more energy than uh, a small country, you're going to use all the energy in the world and how big of a deal that is, how bad that is. But what we're actually seeing, and I've been reporting for, uh, for years now, and we're already starting to see the shift in the media's narrative around this, we're starting to see that actually Bitcoin isn't bad for the environment. As a matter of fact, it could just be the savior. So what do I mean by that? Well, over the last several years, you've seen specifically, I've been watching in Texas, how there's massive problems with the energy system in Texas. Um, they had uh, the power go out in the winter and during a big freeze, and it was a big problem. They had to go out in the summer when it was too hot, and it was a big problem. Uh, last summer happened again, and this summer, it's just happening again. And what happens is, during certain times and periods, you need more energy than others. It's pretty simple. Right. So during the day when everyone's at work, energy use is less <laughs> at night when everybody comes home and has to turn their lights on because it's dark. Energy surges go up uh, when it's hotter. Everyone turns the air condition on higher. Right. So you can see that it's higher uh, use usage changes. But the problem is, is that if I provide energy, I can't just turn it up and down like that. It's not just like a knob that I can control. And so what they've been doing is they've been creating more base load so they can produce more energy all the time, but then diverting some of that load over to Bitcoin mining. And whenever they need that excess demand, they just shut down the Bitcoin mining and put the excess demand over there. When it's not needed, they push it back to Bitcoin mining. And we just saw that Texas was teetering on the edge of blackouts again um, as they've been having this heat wave and as the demand was squeezing on the grid. And so Texas nearly had to start rolling out blackouts, but... They didn't have to because uh, at 9 p.m. local time, they called up the Bitcoin mining companies and said, hey, could you turn off your equipment for us, please? And they did. And all that excess demand was able to go right back to the grid. I mean, if this isn't a wonderful fairy tale story, then I don't know what is. Because there is no other solution for this problem without Bitcoin. Now, we see the same thing happening in Iceland. Iceland's able to create more energy than it needs but most of it's going to waste. They have all this excess energy because when they need to create it for when it surges up, but when it doesn't surge up, what do they do with it? No one in Iceland wants to buy this non-guaranteed power. Factories don't want it. Nobody wants it. Households don't want it. No, no one can use it. That's because most power consumers only need it when they're online, when they're home. But you know who doesn't? Bitcoin. So Bitcoin miners can jump in and grab that excess energy, that, that wasted energy, and use it. And so we're starting to see this change the entire world. The, the, the media narratives change is changing the world. We saw it in Texas happen. They saved the day. It's happening in Iceland, and it's coming to an area near you. Rise of the challengers to the U.S. homogeny, um, the U.S. dollar standard, the U.S. international order, whatever you want to call it. And of course, we see it with Russia and China challenging the U.S. order. Uh, they've been de-dollarizing de for over a decade now, but now we have the rise of the BRICS. And there's some very, very interesting things if you know where to kind of look between the weeds and see what the heck is going on. And really, when you look at things, if you, if you really understand things um, at their first principles level, at their base level from a 
from a philosophical level, you know that energy is the most important thing in the world. Without energy, nothing happens. Life doesn't happen. Plants don't grow. Animals don't grow. We don't live. So everything comes down to energy. And, and the, the, the law of energy states that energy cannot be created. It can only be transferred. So energy from the ground transfers to a plant. When the cow eats that plant, the energy is transferred to the cow. When I eat the cow, that energy is transferred to me. And when I, do, when I think and type on the computer, that energy is transferred. Right? So we transfer. We're always transferring. Oil has been the base of that. And you can look back through history and see that the, the, the nations that have the oil have been the ones that have been the most prosperous and have been able to control kind of the world. And that's why the U.S. dollar has maintained its uh, global homogeny because of the petrodollar. The agreement that was found that started with uh, Saudi Arabia in 1974 to always price dollars in oil. But all of that's being threatened now because of the BRICS nations. And so Russia, part of the BRICS, the R in the BRICS, Saudi Arabia, who's now a new entrance into the BRICS, <clears throat> are now you know, some of the largest oil producers in the world. And they're deciding that they don't want to keep pumping out their scarce resources out into the world in exchange for U.S. dollar treasuries that are just losing value. And so they've been deciding to <clears throat> reduce the amount of oil they're producing. As a matter of fact, Saudi Arabia has extended its voluntary cut of 1 million barrels per day until the end of the year. Now, a lot of this pushed oil prices up, which then in turn put, pushed all energy prices up, which then in turn pushed every single price up. Now, the Biden administration tried to counteract it, and not, not tried to, they did. Um, they were able to counteract that by dumping our strategic petroleum reserves. So they drained them. As a matter of fact, this, the petroleum reserves are now at the lowest levels they've been in 40 years following last year's record drawdowns. At the same time, U.S. production of oil is at an all-time high. As a matter of fact, U.S. produced 12.8 million barrels per day of crude oil in June, matching its production from pre-pandemic back to February of 2020. But even with the U.S.'s increased production, and the draining of the SPR. We're seeing that the oil prices are going back up. They're up to a new one-year high this week, and it looks like it's going to continue moving higher. Now, like I said, in the past, the U.S. has been dumping the SPR, petroleum reserve, into the market to bring, you know, dump more supply to bring the price down. But the problem is, like I said, that it's running low. As a matter of fact, at the lowest since 1983. So, what are they going to do? We're already maxing out the amount of oil we can produce. Uh, we've already dumped pretty much everything that we can into the market. Um, but the problem is, is that no matter how much we dump into the market, which we run out of, no matter how much we produce, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Iran, they just turn theirs down. You see, they can play this game for a lot longer than we can. And so we're not really able to control the price of energy. And it's a problem. And it's a problem because, as I said, when the price of energy goes up, everything goes up. You know that food that you went and eat at Chipotle or you went and picked up at your grocery store? It had to be driven there. And it probably had to be shipped on a plane or a boat to get there. And it probably had to be dug out of the ground with a tractor. And all of those things require energy. And so when the price of energy goes up, everything goes up and, and energy is going up. Now, again, the, the strategic petroleum reserves are not just dwindled down to their lowest level, but they're dangerously low. And so now we're in a situation where the U.S. is actually now trying to refill them and buy more oil. As a matter of fact, the Department of Energy, the DOE, purchased 3 million barrels of crude oil for the SPR for delivery in August. The average price per barrel was $73.00 which is lower than the average price of $95 per barrel that the oil was sold for last year. So they did okay. They sold it for about 95 bucks. So they bought it back for in the 70s. Not a bad trade. They are purchasing this from Exxon, Chevron, Marathon, Valero. Not bad. I don't know if that's a good strategy. I don't think the Biden administration should be trying to trade the oil that we have. Uh, but so far, it's, it, it worked. Now, they had originally said they were going to buy oil when it was in the $70 range. Um, they sort of missed that, but they are buying three. They did buy three million barrels of oil. But here's the problem. You see, in order to get prices to come down, they were selling it to increase the supply. 
But the problem is Saudi Arabia and Russia says, well, then we'll just turn down our supply. We'll counteract that. So now we're in a period where they're turning down their supply. And now the SPR has to be refilled. So what happens with that? Well, uh, if you want to know what I think, I think it means more inflation ahead. I think oil continues to go up. I think that um, inflation continues to go up. And this is a big problem. Now, as I always say, nothing goes up or down in a straight line. Now, a lot of the headlines that you saw basically illustrated that. They just didn't understand what they were saying. So, for example, you saw headlines over the last month or two. Oil's crashing. You know, last several months, six, eight months. Oil's crashing. As a matter of fact, it's the reason why inflation has come back down to where it is. I've broken this down many times. If you look at the CPI basket, the Consumer Price in, um, Index, you can see that it's broken down by food and shelter and energy and things like that. And you can see that it was just energy that